ask you to take a copy of the Bible and open with me to Philippians chapter 3, continuing in our series, again through the book of Philippians, Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, Philippians chapter 3 is where it will be today. And if you don't have a Bible, you'll find one in one of the seats around you. If you don't have a Bible, please take that as our gift and bring that back with you as you come with us uh, to worship week to week uh, here on Sundays. Uh, Here in just a couple of weeks, the Summer Olympics are going to begin. If you've watched TV, you've probably seen any number of coverage of people who are talking about the different members of who's going to be on which team, who's going to qualify. And even people who aren't necessarily sports fans often often watch the Olympics because they want to support our country or just see the competition it's something that's unique uh, and often what often what happens is in between the coverage of the sports events themselves there are these kind of human interest stories where they'll talk about the history of these athletes they'll talk about where they came from what they've done and often they talk about their training routines and one of the things that we'll see is the dedication and the effort that these athletes have put in over the course of their lives usually over the course of many years that has helped them succeed in getting to this level in their respect respective sport, whatever it might be. Many of them from a young age have spent hours in a gym or hours on a field working on their skills. They have very specific and specialized nutrition plans in order to preserve them, to help them maintain their health, to help them recover from the workouts. It's very clear that they did not arrive an Olympic competition without a lot of effort and without a lot of encouragement and without their eye on the final goal of winning a gold medal. And as we return to Philippians 3 today, Paul's going to explain to us that there must be focused effort if we're to mature and grow as Christians. And we're going to find it's in the middle of a section where Paul is explaining to us what the Christian life looks like. In the last couple of weeks, we've talked about justification and how we're made righteous by Christ. Next week, we're going to talk about how even though we're justified, we still need to walk in holiness. And right here in the middle, Paul's going to use the metaphor of a race of athletic competition to explain to us that even though our final goal Our glorified, full knowledge of Christ, even though that has been settled, it's waiting for us, that we still need to exert effort in order to reach it as we grow as followers of Christ. So if you have your place in Philippians 3, I'll ask you to stand with me, invite you to stand with me as we read our passage today, beginning in verse 12. Philippians 3, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, We trust this morning, God. Again, thank you for your Holy Spirit that you have given to us. And Father, we ask that you would teach us, that you'd give us wisdom, Lord. We thank you, Father, for the truth that God Christ holds us. You hold us because of what he has done on our behalf. And Father, we thank you that even when we stumble, he catches us. And even when we feel like letting go, he does not let go of us. And Father, we pray that we would rest in that truth. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Our main idea of the text this morning, or main idea of the sermon, is that we must pursue Christian growth and maturity focused on Christ. We must pursue Christian growth and maturity focused on Christ. So as we walk through these verses this morning, I think there are four things that Paul shows us and teaches us about what it takes in order to grow as a follower of Christ. So the first thing that I think that we see, the first thing that we must realize and embrace if we are to grow as Christians, if we are to pursue the prize, is we need to realize and we must realize that we are not perfect. We must realize that we are not perfect. Verse 12, the first part of verse 12 says this, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. 
Now, we're kind of starting in the middle today again, in the middle of a flow of thought. And so what does Paul mean when he says this? What is the word this referring to? When we, in order to find that, we have to go back into the text prior to see what it is that Paul is referring to. And I think he's talking about the full knowledge of God, which he's talked about in the earlier parts of chapter 3. This full knowledge of God that we only receive and that Paul will only receive when we are in our glorified state, in our resurrection, resurrected body in the full presence of God. That's what he's talking about. So he's saying, I have not yet obtained this knowledge of God that I seek, this knowledge of Christ. And he says something similar in the first part of chapter 13. He says it again, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. And so when we look back at what he's just written prior, he means it is referring to this knowledge that he is seeking. So Paul does not want the Philippians to misunderstand. Even though Paul has told them what the Christian life looks like and what the goal is and what the prize is going to be, he doesn't want them to think that, hey, I've already gotten this. That this thing that I'm teaching you about, this life that I'm helping you on, this truth that I understand, it doesn't mean that I have realized it fully. He's saying to the Philippians, I'm on the same journey of sanctification that you are. I'm on this same path of growing and becoming more like Jesus, just, you, just like you are. I might be more mature. I might be farther along in my journey, but I am not perfect. So one of the first steps in growing in Christ and growing in our Christian faith is to humbly admit that we are not perfect. What's the old cliche that in order for us to, in order for a problem to be solved, we have to admit that there is a problem, that there's something to be dealt with. Paul still battles the flesh. Paul still longs for greater intimacy with Christ. He battles sin and temptation. And I had a professor in seminary who very much modeled this mindset. He was a professor who was, a, who was expected to write and to publish, had written lots of books and articles. But yet he had a family and he had a, a church that he was pastoring through revitalization. And I asked him one time, I said, I want to have a conversation with you about how you, how you manage your time and about how you do all of these things, how you manage productivity. And he said, I will only have that conversation if you'll tell me how you do the same things you do. And at the end of each class, he would always tell us individually, here's what I learned from you today. And in very specific ways that we didn't even realize. So we have to acknowledge that none of us has perfect behavior and none of us has perfect knowledge of anything, much less God. And when we have a humble view of ourselves and a humble view of our, our, our station in sanctification, it helps us in showing grace and mercy to each other when we realize that we're all on the same journey. If we acknowledge and admit that we ourselves are not perfect, it should cause us to show compassion to each other and to have patience with each other, especially when we're confronting and redirecting one another. It should cause this to come from a place of love and from care. It helps us that when we are discipling each other, to remember that they're on a journey. And when people don't grow as quickly as we like, or they don't grow as quickly as we think, it prevents us from becoming frustrated. Because we remember it's only through the grace of God that we grow. So before we can grow, we have to admit that we are not perfect and we need growth. The next thing that I think Paul wants us to see or that we do see is that we press on because of Christ. So we press on in growth. We press on in sanctification because of Christ. Look at the second half of verse 12. It says this, But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So again, he's beginning to use this analogy of running a race of athletic competition, which would have been very familiar to the Philippians. And he says, the goal of knowing Christ then, this thing that I am pressing toward of being glorified in resurrection with him, is only possible because Jesus Christ has made me his own. The focus to which I am running is Jesus himself. 
And I do this because he has made me his own. It takes disciplined effort to grow in Christ, not just in knowledge of him, but of him as a person, in a personal relationship. But Paul does not want to make himself the hero of this story. The hero of this story is not Paul himself. The hero of this story and of our story and the story of our salvation is Jesus himself. He's the hero. And the race that Paul is running and growing in the knowledge of God is only possible because Christ has made Paul his own. The word that the Paul's, Paul's using when it, that's translated to make me his own is a phrase that's referring to it means to seize or to grab on tightly. And so what Paul is saying is, I want to seize and I want to grab on tightly to Jesus. And the same phrase is used when Paul is describing Christ. So he's saying, I want to grab on and hold tightly to Jesus because Jesus has grabbed and is holding tightly on to me. Friends, there's nothing that is going to steal us from Christ's grasp. Nothing can tear us from his hand. And Christ is the one who has achieved and guaranteed our sanctification. And he is the one who purchased the heavenly inheritance that awaits us. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians as he explains it. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification and redemption. All of those things were bought and paid for by Jesus. Jesus earned our sanctification by dying on the cross and being raised from the dead. And when we come to him in faith, repenting of our sins, then Christ makes us his own. And if you're a non-Christian this morning, then hear me say this. You are not saved by running the race and pursuing Christ. You run the race because you are saved by Christ. And if you are a follower of Christ, you were not saved because you were growing in maturity. You are growing in maturity because you were saved by Christ. And the work and effort that you put in in order to grow in maturity is a result of the work that Christ has already done in you. So this race that we are running is run in God's grace, growing in salvation. And friends, this news to us should be freeing. It should be liberating when we remember all that we have in Christ and being justified by faith in him, then we can freely run and pursue sanctification because our justification has been settled and it cannot be added to and it cannot be reversed. So this should motivate us to run after Jesus and to seek to grow in him. I think we might picture it this way as someone who's, who's a rock climber or a mountain climber. If someone's climbing up the face of a rock or the, clays, the face of a mountain, often they're gonna, there's going to be a rope that they're going to hook themselves to that's going to be anchored farther up in a rock or maybe even at the top of the mountain. And they're going to be hooked into this, into this rope, and they can do that because it's anchored in something that can support their weight. They hook into it maybe with carabiners or other apparatus. And because they have confidence that this rope is going to hold them, they're free to climb. They're free to move up to the top. And if your hand slips and you fall a little bit, that rope's going to catch you. Without worrying that you're going to fall if your foot happens to slip or your hand happens to slip. And we can pursue growth with freedom, knowing that if we mess up, that God is faithful and just to forgive us. And we can resume our journey of growth. Our eternal security is not based on how well we pursue holiness. It's based on the work that God has done. Now, there are consequences for our sin even after we are in Christ. And we are called and we must pursue holiness. So don't, don't misunderstand. But we never get to a point where God gives up on us and stops sanctifying us if we are in him. And there must be effort on our part in pursuing it doesn't just, we don't just grow in Christ. Pursuit is not just let it happen. Pursuit takes discipline. It takes routine. Not something that becomes rote, but is intentional. So in our weekly rhythms, we need to be intentional in time to read and study God's word and to pray. 
And friends, don't be afraid to schedule it. If you need to put it on your calendar, put it on your calendar. Spiritual growth is not something that we just ease into. So we don't just let our position in Christ be, let that be it. We are called to move and to grow. And we do so because of what Christ has done in us. The third thing we see is that we press on focused on Christ. We press on focused on Christ. So if we press on because we are in Christ, then we also press on because we are focused and looking at Christ. Look with me uh, in verse 13 then. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead. So one thing that will hinder our growth, either spiritually or in anything else, is going to be looking back at what, it, what has passed. Some of our members here at church have run in marathons and they've run in uh, various other races. How effective are we going to be in running a race if we're constantly looking over our shoulder to where we've been? Now, we can look back at our past and we can learn things, but this is speaking to dwelling in things of the past in a couple of different ways. One of the ways that our past often hurts us is when we, is when we think about the guilt of our past sins and our past failures. This is something that I've often struggled with over the course of my life, feeling guilty for the things that have happened. And Satan loves to remind us of the sins of our past. Do you really think God could use you? Do you remember what you did when you were a kid? Do you remember that time you did that in high school or in college? Man, you blew it in front of your family this week. You should just hang your head in shame. When those feelings of guilt come upon you, and they will, rather than, than, than remaining in those and allowing those things to rest on us, Remember that if you've already repented of it, remind yourself of that and remind yourself that those things were paid for by the blood of Jesus. And then it no longer entangles you. Hebrews 12, 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Scottish pastor Robert Murray McShane wrote it this way in a letter to a friend. He says, For every look at yourself, take ten looks at Christ. He is altogether lovely, such infinite majesty, and yet such meekness and grace. And all for sinners, even the chief, live much in the smiles of God, bask in his beams, feel his all-seeing eye settled on you in love and repose in his almighty arms. Let your soul be filled with his heart-ravishing sense of the sweetness and excellency of Christ and all that is in him. Let the Holy Spirit fill every chamber of your heart so there will be no room for folly or the world or Satan or the flesh. So friends, yes, we learn from our past sins, but we do not want to be so introspective of them that they keep us from running our race. But there's also a danger that our past can pose to us in another way. is when we dwell on past victories or successes. And we, we all know the people who love to relive their glory days, right? Like Uncle Rico, okay, and, and Napoleon Dynamite. Some of you, if you haven't seen that movie, you don't know what I'm talking about. But he's this character, he's a middle-aged character who loves to talk about how good he was when he was in high school. He's constantly filming himself. He's making bets on whether or not he could throw his football over the mountains that are in, the, uh, in the, the background there. But friends, we will not move forward if we look to past victories and successes. See, how great was that when that happened? That's not moving forward. One of the things I've started watching a lot of lately are these documentaries that follow sports teams for a whole season whether it's at the college or the pro level. And what you hear them constantly say week to week, season to season, that was last week, this is this week. This season, this team is different than what we had last year. We won the championship last year, this is a new season. So they have to look forward. Verse 14 then, let's turn into Philippians 3. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So when you're running a race, your aim is the finish line. Your aim is the prize. Your eyes on the prize that awaits you. And in the culture to which Paul is writing to, this prize would have been a crown of leaves. It would have been something that faded. 
And Timothy, when and Paul told Timothy later in his letters to him, said, run for the prize that will not break down. And that's what he's referring to here. The prize that will not expire. The glorification and unhindered communion with God that is waiting for us. So we don't look to the left or to the right. We look to Christ, our prize. The knowledge of him, full knowledge of him that awaits for us. And Hebrews 12, in the chapter that I just read, the verse that directly follows that says, let us run for run with our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So why then is knowing what we are pursuing so important to how we run our race? Why is the focus of what we are running for so important? It's because if we know what we're pursuing, then we know what's waiting for us. And if that thing that we are pursuing is not something we love, then we will not pursue it. So that's the key. That prize that's waiting for us at the end of our race has to be something that we love. Think about something you love. Maybe it's a hobby that you enjoy. If you enjoy fishing, you love fishing, you think about fish from the time you go to bed and you think about them again from when you wake up. You have the Cabela's catalog memorized. When, you ask for, when, you, when people ask you what you want for Christmas, it's this reel or lure or whatever it might be. If you love it, it's going to be a part of your schedule. You're going to learn how to better catch fish. You pursue what you love. So if we don't love something, we're not going to pursue it. If we don't see the value of it, if we don't think it's worth anything, that we will not strain forward to it trying to grasp it. So to pursue Christ, you must love Christ. And when we love Christ, we want to please him and we want to be obedient. But where does the love that causes us to pursue him come from? It doesn't come from within us. The love that we pursue Christ with comes from God himself through the power of the Holy Spirit. We know that we have talked about, Paul talked about it in weeks prior, about how we grow and how we pursue Christ and how we are made alive again by the power of the Holy Spirit. But how do we experience the power of the Holy Spirit? How does this power of the Holy Spirit cause us to love God? How do we experience it? Because we, when we think of power, we think of something that's instantaneous. I can flip a light switch and I see the light comes on. It's visual. It's instant. For us, it might be a little bit differently. But one of the ways that we experience the power of God, as I said, is through the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, he changes our heart and he bears forth the fruit of the Spirit. And what is the first fruit of the Spirit? Love. So the love that we love God with comes from God himself. The love that we will pursue Christ with comes from God himself, comes from the Holy Spirit. So the way that we experience God and experience the, Holy, the power of the Holy Spirit in our sanctification is through the shaping of our love for God, among other things. So as our love for Christ increases, the sharper our focus on him will become. We grow in our desire to gaze at him, to see his beauty, to see his worth, to see his majesty. And it causes us to run the race for the prize of knowing him and being with him, a prize that is already ours. So when we think of power, we might think of things that happen quickly, but they don't always happen quickly. As I said, part of straining forward for us may be slowing down and gazing at Christ, growing in your wonder and awe of him. And if you're struggling today to press on in growth, then ask God to produce in you the love for him that causes you to pursue him. That doesn't mean you don't love him. doesn't mean you don't already love him. But ask him to stir those affections in you. And if you're not growing the way you'd like to be, then friends, pray, as I said, would stir those affections. And then as God does that, begin to see what's one change in your life that you could make that might affect many other things. Is there one habit or one sin that if you change would affect your growth in a positive way in lots of different directions? 
And if so, seek to make that change in the power of God. The fourth thing that I think we see here from Paul that relates to our Christian growth is that as we press on, we grow in humility. As we press on, we grow in humility. Look with me at verse 15 of Philippians 3. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Now, some of your translations, instead of mature, if you're reading a different translation, it might say perfect, those of us who are perfect. What Paul is saying is those who are mature or those who are closer to completion, think this way. In other words, remember that you are not perfect. Those of you who are closer to being perfect ought to think and know that you are not perfect. Some say he's actually making a play on words. He's kind of having some fun at the expense of the Judaizers that he condemned that we saw in our sermon last week. And then we get a little bit of a strange phrase here where Paul says that if any of them think otherwise, God will reveal this also. So it seems there at the end of verse 15 that he's talking about disagreements and he could possibly be talking about people who might be disagreeing with the things that Paul has just taught. And if so, he's saying that if you disagree with what I've taught you, God will straighten that out. He'll reveal to the truth to you. We also know there were disagreements in Philippi. We've seen that referenced. And it could be he's talking about those specific disagreements. And he's saying, God, as you grow, God will sort out those disagreements. That could be what he's referring to there. And then in verse 16, he commands them to hold true to what they have already attained. And if we go back into uh, the earlier parts of chapter 3, we realize what, they've, what have they already attained. Well, they've already attained justification as Christ has attained it for them. And they've attained a future resurrection that belongs to them, but they do not yet have. So again, it's that already, but not yet. They have attained it, but yet they haven't yet attained it. And he's saying, live consistently with this heavenly citizenship that you have attained and will one day see in fulfillment. And in doing these things, you will show the marks of our growth. So I think what he's getting at then is to help us to realize that humility and growth in humility will be a sign of Christian maturity. As we grow in faith and as we strain toward Christ, I think what we really begin to see is how imperfect we really are. Paul explains in 2 Corinthians when he's explaining to the church at Corinth that they're to be the aroma of Christ, that as we become the aroma of Christ, we see how inadequate we are to the task. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 2. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. And then just listen to what he says. Who is sufficient for these things? The truth is, the closer, we go to, the closer we get to Christ, and the more we grow in maturity, the more we realize that none of us are sufficient for that. Charles Spurgeon explained it well, and he says, I suppose that the nearer we get to heaven, the more conscious we shall be of our imperfections. The more light we get, the more we discover our own darkness. And you may have a sense of this. If you ever travel to beautiful, majestic places or you've stood on top of a mountain or maybe you've been somewhere like the Grand Canyon, just these beautiful scenes and you begin to realize just how small you really are in the whole grand scheme of things. The closer you get to something that is great, then you get almost this feeling of being overwhelmed. And this is the way it is with Christ. The closer we get to him, the more progress we realize we have to make. The light of Christ shows us our sin. And the closer we are to him, the, the greater we realize our own weaknesses because we greater see his perfection. And the closer we come to Christ, the more we understand our need for him. And the more mature we come in the Christian faith, the greater we appreciate what we have been saved to and what we have been saved from. And the more we understand how inadequate we are and have been, what we've been and, in, and inadequate we are to do what we've been called to do, the more we realize our dependence on God and His grace. 
And we see the link specifically between humility and maturity in 1 Timothy in the qualification of elders. Paul told Timothy not to appoint new converts to the role of elder because he says they may grow conceited if you make them an elder. So that must mean that the more mature we are, the more humility we will have. And if we are in leadership or aspire to leadership in any capacity in the church, we should follow Paul's example of admitting that we are not perfect. And it's tempting for ones in leadership to never admit any weaknesses and to always act as he or she has the answer for everything. And it becomes particularly tempting when people come to leaders for answers and they don't want to look like they don't have the answers. But a humble leader admits that he doesn't have all the answers because they are on the same journey, as I said, with everyone else. An elder is a sinner saved by grace, just like everyone else. And we're continuing to seek to grow in maturity and in faith as everyone else. A growth group leader, a teacher, a deacon, all saved and sanctified by God in the same way. But those in leadership must not, must not just sit on the truth of their inadequacy, but must seek to grow and be examples for those who want to grow. And if you aspire to leadership, which is a good thing that Paul says, then seek to grow in humility before you seek to, seek to attain a position. So if you'll permit me one more mountain climbing illustration. When I was in high school, uh, one of the books that I read was uh, Into Thin Air by John Krakauer. I'm sure some of you have read that. Um, uh, it's about a really a doomed um, uh, expedition on Mount Everest. Okay, But one of the things when I read that is I just became fascinated with the process of what it takes to climb Mount Everest. Now, I don't have any aspiration of ever climbing Mount Everest. Maybe I'd love to be able to go to base camp one day or see Mount Everest, but to do what they do, I'd rather read about it, watch movies about it, and admire it than actually try to do it myself. But there are a lot of risks, obviously, in climbing that mountain and in any other, but one of the big ones is altitude sickness because there's so little oxygen as you go up in the higher levels of elevation. And so to compensate, climbers have to acclimate a little at a time. And so what they do is they'll climb, usually between a total of about five camps on their way up and down the mountain. They start at base camp, they'll go to camp one and then camp two. And then when they get to camp two, you think, okay, they're ready to go forward. No, they actually go from camp two back down to camp one and spend some more days there. And so it's this process of if the weather, can, weather cooperates of about 66 to 70 days back and forth, up and down this mountain over rocks and ice and snow. And so it's a series of steps forward and backward. And in some ways, it mimics our journey in the Christian faith. Now, I know it doesn't mimic it perfectly. Our glorification is guaranteed our resurrection is guaranteed. Summoning Mount Everest is not guaranteed. And we don't seek to retreat as Christians in the way that they would in climbing that mountain. But there are times in the Christian life where we'll grow quickly and when things won't go the way we want. There'll be times when we're excited about being in God's word. We'll be excited and we're growing in our understanding of the Lord and it will happen quickly. We experience victory over sin and temptation. And in those times where things are good and we're growing quickly, we need to remember that we do not grow prideful as we grow in the Lord. We need to be grateful for the work of Christ in us as we become more like him, helping others to spur others on in growth as well. But as I said, there's going to be other times when we don't grow as quickly. We're going to feel somewhat stagnant. And maybe we even take a few steps back. We will experience discouragement. And we may feel as though there are long periods of time in the spiritual desert. Or even in the moments when we're striving, we still don't feel like we're making any movement forward. In those moments, remember that the grace of God is sufficient and that he has not forgotten you. Preach to yourself the truth of your salvation, that the prize we seek is promised and held for us and that it is imperishable. And if our grip on God slips a little bit, know that his grip on us will not slip. And in those times when you're in the desert, remember, don't try to sit in the desert alone. Seek out other brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage you, to pray for you, to mourn or grieve with you or whatever it is that you might need. 
The burdens of life that we carry in this race get heavy and awkward. And let's follow Paul's command to bear them with each other as we run this race together. One of the things that you'll see, everybody in, in the Olympics, they're competing for one prize. There's one gold medal. For us in the Christian faith, we all get the prize. So friends, we have a joy of a prize that awaits us at the end of our race. And our prize is not a crown that fades away, but it's a Savior whom we long to see. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for how you have equipped us with the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your Son who has paid for our redemption. And we thank you, Father, for you who is carrying us along each step of the way. Father, we ask that you would continue to grow us in faith, that you would grow us in maturity, Father. And Lord, in the moments when it doesn't happen as quickly as we want, Lord God, Help us, Father, remember that it has been sealed for us, Lord, and that we, can, that we can trust and depend on you. And Father, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.